Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, he's not even a returning guest. He's a friend of the pod at this point. Um, Andrew Claudio is not joining us in the background for this one, but I want to make sure I get this out up top. Um, Mike Bassick, Andrew Claudio says, enjoy De- Jacob DeGrom. The Mets will enjoy everybody else. I understand. Um, if he's healthy, he's great. But I mean, even here, we're doing like, Hey, over under 20 starts over under 120 mm. innings. Like it's like, man, you could be paying two. We're expecting about $2 million to start. We hope it's better than that, but it'll be fun <laughs> when he, when he does pitch, it will be fun. Oh, I mean, I think that's an understatement. Uh, when he pitches, when he pitches, you guys will, you guys will have a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so listen, we got, uh, as I'm sure you've been talking about on one Oh five, three, the fan, um, where you of course, uh, do some outstanding work talking about all Dallas sports, but uh, the Mavericks are what we're going to talk about today. Um, we got round two uh, of this year's Knicks uh, Mavs go around. It seems like these teams always play good, um, fun games. Uh, that was the case for one half of basketball the last time they played. And then you didn't like the third quarter. You know, oddly enough, Mike, I did not care for it. <laughs> <laughs> you so I, I, let's start there. You, um, I hope you don't mind me saying you were visiting yeah. uh, with your family in New York yeah. for the time, and um, you know, enjoying the sights and sounds of the city. How was it like to be in the the garden for those uh, those fireworks? Man, it was awesome because at one point, just because you're talking about the first half, my 14 year old son looks at me and goes, "We're 10 for 40 from the field," and talking about my Dallas Mavericks, our Dallas Mavericks, and it's like. Yeah, we're horrible. And I'm just thinking, is it best to just tank and just take a 5% chance at getting uh, Victor? I always say his last name wrong, but Wib and Wamba. Wib, Wib. And, <laughs> That's close enough. Wib and Yada, yeah. Wib and Wamba. Um, but oh, I'm yeah. like, this is just horrible. And then the third quarter happened where the Mavs couldn't miss. In fact, they just did that again on Christmas in the third quarter. So I, it was fun because afterwards, not that day, I was in New York and we just had a blast. We loved New York during Christmas time. And thank you for some recommendations. It was great. Um, but later, uh, a few days later, I checked out your post game show and it was all about firing the head coach. And then you guys went on an eight game winning streak. Yes, <laughs> there, there, there was some of that in the air. That You know, it, it's funny. Um, well, this is really what I wanted to ask you because I think it was relevant to that time and it's less relevant now, but now after the winning eight in a row, the Knicks have lost three straight and there's again, some consternation. We hear from pro athletes that are in the midst of either very low lows or very high highs that like speaking to us, they're like, well, you guys, the fans think it's these huge highs and huge uh, and huge lows to us. It's more like it's the next game. It's business. Is that true? Or are they full of it? It's somewhat true. Obviously an NBA season's half of an MLB season, but when you are losing pretty regularly for, let's say a two week stretch for the NBA, that would be like, let's say a five or six game losing streak. Sure. It gets old because you're, you start getting used to, I'll just talk about the baseball field. You start getting used to sitting in the dugout, the game being over, going in the clubhouse, showering, eating, answering questions and going home. And you're like, man, like when was the last time we high fived after a game on mm-hmm. the field? And so you start doing that. And then the thing is, if you do that for, let's just say two weeks, and you high five 10 out of 11 times because you're on a 10, 10 game winning streak or you've won 10 out of 11, it feels like you're not going to lose. So you get into late game gotcha. situations and you're close. As long as it's close, you're like, we're going to figure this out. We're going to get a base runner on base. We're going to get a big hit. The other team's going to make the mistake that we're going to take advantage of. So yes and no. So I think it's a great question. It is more even kill than a fan. Some people are like, how did you ever pitch? And I'm like, well, guess what? I didn't pitch like the way I fan, you know, like, I mean, I did That's get mad call. at myself, but as a fan, I can be more emotional as a pitcher. Yes. There's emotions going in inside me, but I got to take all that emotion and put it into the next four days to get myself ready for the next game. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and it does answer the question. And it, it, you know, like when you consider this, I'm looking at this Knicks season, and I'm also looking at this Mav season. And we we talk offline a, a lot, and there seems to be all these highs and all these lows. And yet we sit here and 
both teams are 18 and 16, right? And it's like, maybe you, are you guys maybe playing a little under expectations? I, I think we're still playing a little bit above expectations despite three losses in a row. But like, does it feel about where you, where you thought they would be? I thought they would be a better team, but maybe I was way too hopeful about Christian Wood. Not that I dislike Christian Wood. Jason Kidd does like dislike Christian Wood. He's seems like he's, it. he's not a big fan of his. It's weird. We've kind of talked about what's the connection here between Cuban, Nico Harrison, and Jason Kidd because in the off season they did three moves. Not losing Jalen Brunson, but three moves. They brought in Christian Wood for nothing and, and a first round pick. They go and they get JaVale McGee and they draft Jaden Hardy. They trade for Jaden Hardy out of the G League, high second round pick. And it's like Jason Kidd dislikes all of those players. And we're like, shouldn't you maybe check with the head coach if he's not really a fan of these guys? I think he was a fan of McGee because he was with the Lakers team that won the championship. He was an assistant yeah. coach on, but four games into the season, he's like, you're done, man. And, and literally McGee could care less to be on the Dallas Mavericks, which really stinks. Christian Wood, because he's not a good defensive player and screws up defensive rotations left and right, which, okay, he's still way more talented than yeah. Dwight Powell, way more talented than Maxi Kleba, way more talented than, let's say, JaVale McGee. Those are kind of the big guys. So it's like, I get it. Why do you put him in the doghouse for doing things yep. wrong? But like Dwight Powell's in the right spot. It doesn't matter. He still didn't get the rebound. He's in the right spot. He still didn't make the shot at least that guy could be in the wrong spot and still make something positive happen. So it's been frustrating because I thought Christian Wood would have a bigger impact, um, but really the biggest impact, and you can see it in the numbers, and you can look at it as a positive way. I look at it in a negative way. Losing Jalen Brunson has wow. put everything on Luka. And so, yes, he's putting up his best numbers ever. And you could say, hey, he's the MVP. But I mean, he literally has to do everything now. And it's just so tough. And the Mavericks miss Jalen Brunson, especially that second half Jalen Brunson that we saw last year yeah. so much. Well, give me, I'll, I won't vamp too long about Jalen um, because I've been doing it all season. Uh, listeners of the show uh, obviously know that I think if the Knicks do get an all star representative, um, for as much as Julius Randle has been playing out of his mind on the offensive end, and, and RJ Barrett had a very nice game the other night and he's been on a nice stretch, I think it has to be Brunson. I think, you know, you, we talked about it, but there are things I think about him that, for as good as the, the numbers are, that are just not quantifiable in numbers. The, the impact he has had, I, I really I genuinely believe he has had an impact on the locker room. That is part of why they took, because the vibes here were just not good last season right. and the vibes are really good now. And like for you guys, I think, is it more, I think it's more on the court though, for you guys, or, or am I wrong? Is, is Do you think you're missing some of that off court stuff too? Well, yes and no. Uh, I think Jalen Brunson coming from Villanova being on obviously a, a winning situation. I'll be honest that that Dallas Maverick game for you last year where the Mavs came to Madison Square Garden and you guys just looked totally lost in the third quarter and didn't show any fight the rest of that game. I think without Jalen Brunson, and I love Julius Randle, you know, I love Julius Randle, but I think if you're yeah. Julius Randle led or you're RJ Barrett, 22, 23 year old led, yeah. you might start losing more and more in the whole Thibodeau getting fired yeah. might really happen. I sure. do think without following the Knicks super closely, I do think Jalen Brunson is a great guy to have in those situations where you have like a letdown game or a letdown week where Jalen, I think is a very tough positive, steady guy in yeah. your club or in your locker room. Sometimes yeah. I say clubhouse because of baseball, but um, one does the other. so I do think the Mavs miss some of that, but really what they really miss is another ball handler, creator, score. Uh, they're just very limited. I know you're probably doing your post game the other day after the Christmas day game when the Mavs were playing, but there are multiple times where who Hubie Brown or whether it was at halftime, Will Bond and Jalen Rose are like, look, like you got to get Lucas some more help after losing Jalen Brunson and really adding not much in the off season. He's just asked to do everything. Well, I was going through it today and um, it's man, the, the NBA is so predictable in, in some ways. Like the Knicks have had a nice season, right? We're 18 and 16. I'm looking at it. Even with three straight losses, since we played you guys we still have the best net rating in the league. Um, over those 11 games, you guys are down in the the low to mid teens. So like on paper, 
you go by that, right? The Knicks should come out on top. And yet the Knicks have played um, by my count, 10 of like the legitimate MVP candidates this season. One of which is Luca. Guess how many of those games they've won, Mike? It's nice round three. number. No, that, that would be zero. Oh. They are, oh, yeah, yeah. They're 0 for 10. Um, the closest thing to an MVP candidate they've beaten is Donovan Mitchell. They they, they won one game against the, the Cavs. I mean, and to me, he's on the periphery of the, the race looking inside. You want to beat the Mavs, just sit out all your good players. Somehow the Mavs lose every game that <laughs> the other team decides that the other guys can't play. But that's like, that's the, isn't that the crazy part though about the league and like where you guys are and where we got, where we are, because I find it so fascinating here. The Knicks are, they've played well. I mean, I don't think you can deny that they've played well of late. And yet we go up on Christmas day against that monster, Joel Embiid and James Harden, who looked kind of like prime, prime James Harden to me, it, you know, the refs always help him out, but neither in or there. And it's like, great. This is all fun and games. What we're doing. If a star's not here, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. And here, there are you guys where it's like, okay, we have the literally the toughest thing to get. We have not only an engine, maybe the best. I, I, I'm i a big Luca fan. You, you know, I'm a big Luca fan. And yet it feels like listening to you, your plight is every bit as bad as ours because you're, you know, it, when you have one of those guys, it feels like the clock is always ticking. Do you guys in Dallas, are you starting to get any of, of that like clock ticking sense? A little bit. I don't know if you, you know, read Tim McMahon at all. He writes for, I do. And, and he kind of wrote an article, I don't know, let's say a month or two ago. And he kind of said, look, the Mavs have kind of two years to get this right. Like Luke That's is it. not going to, there's a, he just signed the extension. He's in his fifth year. It's kind of like fifth, sixth, seventh year. Everybody stays. It's kind of that seventh, eighth year where an Anthony Davis or somebody like that starts complaining about their situation or demanding out of a situation. And so I think if the Mavs, let's just say losing the first round this year and do it again the next year, I think then you start hearing the Luca just can't get it done in Dallas because there's just not enough help. And that's when it starts happening. So I think we have this year and two more years of Luca before if Mark Cuban doesn't start doing better. And that's the thing about here is what we don't know is Mark Cuban might be way more Jerry Jones than what people give Jerry Jones credit or discredit for. Jerry's so old, he doesn't even know the players on the Cowboys. He can't name them. You Is that true? 100%. We interview him every week. The other day oh, wow. when we were okay. talking about Odell that. Beckham Jr., he's like, well, he could go with, you know, uh, Wilson and Ram. And we're like, oh, crap. Wilson is not on the team anymore. He signed a free agent contract with, I believe, Je uh, Miami. And then Ram is CD Lamb. And oh, he's yeah. just, he's like, crap. Like, it's just stuff like that where you're like, he's not really doing much. But Mark Cuban, this is where I don't know if Nico Harrison is actually the general manager or if he like has a big say in it, but Mark Cuban does everything. And so where we're at now with Luca is we're just so depleted in talent around him. You'd rather have, I will say this, Jonathan, and you can, you can say yes or no. I, oh, I already know what you're going to say. I'm going to say yes, but say what say I would it. rather have the Maverick situation where you have the superstar and you have to find four better players around him than have eight players you like, but you got to find somebody that's considered a top 10 player in the league. It, it's for me, it's not even about that. For me, the thing with Luca. I have this debate with Andrew oftentimes when we do our, our Patreon pod about, about the league at large it, to, to him, me putting Luca over Giannis is ridiculous as like the guy that I'd most want to build around. Like my number one, you know, Tatum probably, I guess should be in that discussion at this point too. And you know, God knows I'm disrespecting guys like Jokic and, and maybe even Embiid. whatever. There's a lot of guys. Luca's always been my guy because for him, I think he's the eat like, you, you don't have to worry about fitting pieces around Luca. Just put any talented basketball. Ideally, it's shooting, right? You want to fit around him with shooting, but that's any team. Like any team, you need to surround your star with shooting. It doesn't matter what. So I, I think he is arguably the easiest guy to build around. I think he's the biggest matchup advantage, singular, like single player matchup advantage. I, I'm going to be fascinated to see after you guys give this pickup, because I don't think it's going to land in the top 10 um, to, to the Knicks. And then you're going to be able to put all of the picks on the table. It's four first, three swaps. I don't know who's going to be available for that, but you have to figure 
at least you have that right option. You have the, you could give the full basket to whoever right. it is. And, but where does that get you? I don't know. Cause like you said, there's no like hot young player on the, like it's Josh green and. Yeah. Know, they, really you know, it, right? there's, there's not much, you know, there's just not much that the Mavs have that the NBA wants. And I think Nico Harrison slash Mark Cuban ran into that issue in the off season after losing Jalen Brunson, I was told by multiple people connected with the Mavs said, they know they can't go into the season with just Luca and Dinwiddie as ball handlers. They know they need another one and they're going to get another one, Mike. And then you got to the season and they didn't get one. And from what I heard is they had some things lined up that they thought could happen and they all fell through. I don't know exactly why they fell through, you know, but I'm going to guess some of it is, is they thought somebody will want Dwight Powell's expiring contract. Somebody will want a, Reggie Bullock and a Tim Hardaway Jr. type of deal to get this ball handler off their team to get some shooters or wing guys on their team. And it never came about. And so I think the Mavs are in a situation where they need another all-star player. I I think at least borderline all-star player. Um, But at the same time, here's what I worry about Luke. And I don't know this. I think he's amazing. You see him in international ball, beat all the best players and stuff like that. But is he playing enough NBA games? This is his fifth season where he hasn't really had another guy with him. And Brunson was a late bloomer. I know he came out after four years of Villanova, but his first three years, he was just like a nice role player off of the bench. And last year started really accelerating his growth is if you get another guy who kind of likes having the ball, let's say, yes, let's just say Zach Levine, because he's kind of maybe going to get moved because he likes wanting the ball too much. Yep. Well, has Luca played in 200 or 300 something games where he's like, I don't really know how to share the ball as well in the NBA because I've done this so many times this way that I don't want to maybe be off the ball. I don't know that. And, and I think to that end, the LeBron AD blueprint from a couple of years ago, say what you want, Mickey Mouse championship, this and that. But that that was pretty good blueprint as far as a, a you know a big a big engine like in terms of LeBron Luca and then a guy who is a multifaceted player can do a lot of different things but he's also you know he could finish plays around a guy like LeBron or Luca I don't know where that guy is for you um you gave me a natural lead up to my my last question for you you've had um, a couple dips in the old uh, Kemba Walker pool uh what's your what's your experience like with uh, Mr Walker who speaking of Tim McMahon just tweeted out a little while ago that uh, after playing, how many minutes did Kid play him? The other forty in, in Cleveland. He needed everybody sat out because they played back to back, and he's yeah. like, and and Kimball was doing great. Kimball well, looked like 2018 Kimball Walker, and then he's, and then after the game was over, he's like, yeah, guess what? My knee hurts. Yeah, there's a shocker. And look, we we were there last year. We had we had that. We had, what, Eastern Conference Player of the Week, Kimball Walker. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know. I don't know. You're, I'm hoping you guys aren't counting on Kemba from here on in. You're well, I don't think the Mavs were, but then after he had a nice game and then had a really good game against Cleveland, he was the star player. He took him to overtime. Lucas sat out that game for rest purposes and they almost won. They took Cleveland to overtime. Very good team. Kemba had, I don't know. I'm going to guess 32. I think it was right around 30, 32 yeah. points. Um, And you're like, oh, man, this is the 15 to 20 minute ball handler we need off the bench. But then immediately he's missing games left and right. Like he hasn't played since he played one game since, I believe, and his knee was bugging him. And so now they're hoping he can play against the Knicks. But, you know, it's 50 50. I know going into the game if he's going to play and then they're like, well, he'll play the next game. But that's that's how can you rely on a guy that's that inconsistent with his body, you know, and that's the one thing about Mark Cuban and and people that are analytic people or John Daniels, former general manager of the Mavs. I was talking to or the Rangers. I was talking to him the other day and it's all about this health thing in in sports. We're going to keep guys healthier longer. And this has been going on a long time, but the body, the, the human body, even though we can improve it, it still has its limitations. Once it gets into its thirties, 99% 99% of guys just start breaking down. There are the LeBron Jameses or the Dirk Nowitzkis or Kobe or Tim Duncan come to mind. But for the most part, you end up with Kimball Walkers, Amari Stoudemire, Anfer, Anthony Hardaway. Like there's just so many guys, Derek Rose. And I know he got hurt early in his career, but man, wow. right when you hit about 32, 33, the body starts breaking down. And at 35, there's diminishing returns on players. And I know that 
scientists, analytic people, general managers are trying to move the number to 40 or move the number to everybody plays well till they're 35 because we've sat them out 20 games a year and we've done all this. But still, the body breaks down. I'm going to assume Kemba didn't play 82 games every game in Charlotte, uh, you know, and he didn't make long playoff runs. I know that. No. And so it still broke down on him. So as, as much as new technology has tried to help, it's kind of, to me, Jonathan, it frustrates me when I see a guy pitching well in the sixth inning of a big game and like, we got to take him out because if, if, if we're going to get this contract through five years, we got to take him out right now in the sixth inning. I'm like, you don't know. You don't know if he's going to break down. If you throw him 20 more pitches, you don't know if he's going to stay healthy. Like to me, God didn't stop making Nolan Ryan's. Now they're few and far between, but we stopped giving Nolan Ryan a chance to be Nolan Ryan. That's good. That's well, well done, sir. I mean, I just looked it up. Jacob DeGrom, 35 years old in June. So yeah, it's, it's it's a, a, we could do a whole podcast. I'd love to on the Mets. And I mean, the Mets are our number two team in our household right now because my 14 year old son's favorite player is Francisco Lindor, just an unbelievable person, unbelievable player. And my 12 year old son who plays first base, his favorite player in baseball is Pete Alonzo. So wow. two favorite players in baseball are on the Mets yet. They are Ranger fans growing up here and getting to go to all the games. We will, we will do a slightly more baseball centric podcast uh, come summertime. In the meantime, as always, I wish I could look, uh, wish you luck. I'm not going to because I don't like to lie to my friends. As long um, as you keep answering my text, I'll be okay. I know <laughs> I text too much basketball questions, but you're you're one of the people I really respect uh, your basketball knowledge. Uh, I respect all of your knowledge. Mike Bassick, for anyone who may not know, could you just tell the folks at home where they could find you? You can find me on 105.3 The Fan. That is on the Odyssey app, obviously, or if you're kind of in that New York region uh, up there. And then also during the Major League Baseball season, if you ever get the Major League package, I am on the pregame and postgame television-wise uh, for the Texas Rangers, a la the Jacob DeGroms. I'm... T- I don't know how many I'm going to ask. I'm, I just remind me, I'm going to ask Andrew when I talk to him, how many Mets fans or what percentage of Mets fans he thinks will carry their fandom of DeGrom over to the point where they're like, I he's pitching tonight for the Rangers. I want to tune in and I want to see how he does. I don't know if it's going to be that much, I wonder, but I'm, I'm curious. I, I wonder if they won't root for him, but they're going to watch just to see. That could be. Yeah, for sure. That could be it. That'll be interesting. Uh, now, I, here's how I found out real quick. I was at, is it yeah. called Franklin? Is it Franklin where the skating rink is near, um, near the uh, train station? Not, is it we, you, uh, in New York? Yeah. In New York. I was in New York when it went down. I was in uh, near the train station. Oh my God. Near, um, near, near, there's uh, a, there's a, a rink in Rockefeller center by the big tree. Well, your, your New York people might know where I'm talking about, but it's a beautiful place. And there was a skating rink there. Kids skated there. It was really close to where we were staying at. Okay. Um, and, oh, maybe Bryant Park. That's probably it. Yes. Yes. There Bryant Park. Thank you. And so I hear these uh, couple talking behind me as my, uh, my wife and daughter are shopping and me and the boys are walking and they start talking to Grom. And I thought I heard Rangers and I go, I turn around and say, Hey, Hey, what's this DeGrom thing you're saying? Cause I'm with my family, I'm not on my phone or anything. And they're like, yeah, DeGrom just signed with the Rangers. And I was like, Oh my God. And my kid, my kids were like, Ooh, and I was like, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. We'll see how it works out. So. Um, I wish you the best of luck for DeGrom that, that I, I always enjoy. And look, the, uh, I'm rooting for all lefties. So, I mean, the New York Knicks have gone all lefty on me. Almost. Uh, we're, we're getting close. Uh, Mike Basic, you're the man. Uh, happy holidays again. Appreciate you hopping on on late notice. And we will, of course, talk again soon. Thanks a lot, guys.